Hello! Today we'll be breaking down my VFX scene. This is the scene setup that I use for most, if not all, my portfolio pieces. I'll be showing the Godot version for this video, but I'll keep the concepts and explanations as engine independent as possible. It's important to note that this breakdown is more suited for a portfolio piece rather than a full game. If you need a VFX test scene for your game, it is much, much better to have a scene that matches your in-game environment exactly, so you can accurately see what your VFX will look like at runtime. Without further ado, let's begin. Let's start with the physical aspects of our scene, which gives us enough info to ground or contextualize our VFX, but not enough to take attention away from it. The first thing we'll be adding is a floor, which is just a plane that stretches towards the Z and X axis, or whichever ones aren't the up axis in your engine. You can also add the collider to it in case your VFX interacts with the environment. For its look, you have two options, a flat color and a checkerboard. Flat color is easier to set up as it uses the default material with your preferred tint and other properties. You can see this in my early works and at the time I preferred this because it looks pretty clean. However, I have grown to love the checkerboard look as it breaks the monotony of a flat colored plane and it gives the artist and the viewer a better idea of the scale of the VFX, with one square matching a 1x1 unit of the engine. The simplest way to achieve the checkerboard look is to add a checker texture with your preferred colors and tint. Then adjust the tiling of the texture so that each square is equivalent in size to a 1x1 unit in your engine. If you want to, you can go the extra mile and make a custom shader where you can customize the colors. You can do so by grabbing a color channel of your plain black and white checkerboard and then using the linear interpolation function to mix between the 0 and 1 values. But which colors should you choose? All my portfolio pieces so far have used dark colors for the floor because it really helps make my VFX pop. But I was actually given the advice by Sir Raffles to go on the lighter side in terms of coloring your floor because games won't usually have you make your VFX in this dark an environment. By doing so, we can get used to making VFX for a brighter environment early on, and it makes for a smoother adjustment to when you start working at a studio or on your own game. Once you have your floor down, we can add our entities. For our scene, we'll be having one sphere as our enemy. This is just an additional component to help give the viewers a better idea of the scale of your VFX. So scale your entity to your preference. You can even swap it out with something that'll better highlight your VFX. Or, if you don't actually need any, you can just opt not to add anything. Next up is lighting. I prefer having shadows on the softer side and pointed away from the camera. Having the light be a bright white color is a safe bet, but you can make the color lean slightly towards your effect's main or complementary color if you like. And last of course is the camera, so we can actually see our VFX. The most common FOV is 60 degrees, but you're of course free to deviate from that. And the placement is all up to you as well but I'd recommend finding a position that shows your VFX in all its glory. Now that the physical aspects of our scene are set up, it's time we move to our post-processing, starting with everyone's favorite, Bloom. For all you visual learners, here's what it does. Boom, bap. Your brights are now brighter. While it is coated, make sure not to overdo it. And a good way to know if you're overdoing it is if the plain white object in your scene, such as our sphere, starts to glow by default. Next is the fog, which is mainly for blending the background with the skybox. This works much better with the floor stretched as far away as possible. Each engine has their different fog settings, so you have to play around with that in order to find the perfect blend into the skybox. But here's what I have in Godot at the moment. Lastly, we have the vignette. The vignette is the dark, usually blurry shadow around the edges of the camera. This places the focus more on the center of the camera where most of the action is happening. Unity and Unreal have their own in-engine options for this through their post-processing modules. And Godot has a wide selection of vignette shaders, or shaders in general, in godotshaders.com. The vignette is more of a personal preference though, so again, feel free to leave it out for your own scene. That's pretty much everything you need to get started visually. But there is someone who wants in on our VFX scene, and we'll get him in eventually through this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives, with thousands of classes led by industry experts across film, illustration, productivity, and more. Skillshare can help you take your VFX and your hobbies to the next level. After a refreshing break and mental reset with Dan Dunlew's meditation course, 
now is a good time to revisit Pixel 3D's Blender course, and in turn, revisit our old friend, Bob. I've moved to the animation part of the course and after some time, hard work, and dedication, I've animated Bob to do what I do best, run away from my problems. In style. But in all seriousness, being able to animate my own characters is huge for me because instead of spending hours trying to find the right animation for my planned VFX, I can just spend more than thrice as much time making my own animations. If you want to join me in this animating journey, the first 500 people to use my link in the description will receive a 1 month free trial of Skillshare. Again, the first 500 people to use my link in the description will receive a 1 month free trial of Skillshare. So get started today. Now back to the topic. This next part will be focusing on some scripts that streamline my VFX creation. And as usual, I'll be focusing more on explaining the concepts behind these scripts. But I'll also do my best to show the technical side. Camera Shake allows us to communicate to the viewer the energy that our VFX has, which I believe is a significant factor to your VFX, as explained in my video about environmental impact. The camera shakes in my VFX are almost all done through my camera shaker script. So let's break down how we set this up. The camera shaker should be the parent of the camera, and the camera's local position and rotation should be set to zero. This makes it easy for us to reset the camera to the original view after shaking. Shaking can be done by offsetting the camera's position and rotation repeatedly across a specified duration. We offset the position by choosing a random point in a sphere and moving our camera to that point. Unity has spoiled me with random dot inside unit sphere, but if you want to implement your own, we can choose a random point in a sphere using spherical coordinates. Wolfram Mathworld has a page that explains this way better than I ever will in my life. But to sum it up, we choose an angle from the x-axis, an angle from the z-axis, and then the distance from the center. That's our random point. Once we have that, we can move on to offsetting our camera's rotation, which is simply done by choosing random values for x and y, and setting those as the x and y rotation of our camera. How far the position is offset, or how much the camera is rotated, is dependent on our camera shake's intensity. And how often the camera's position and rotation are set depends on our shake frequency. A frequency of 1 means the camera shakes every 1 second. The smaller it is, the more often it shakes. All the properties we've talked about can then be controlled through your animation players, timelines, sequencers, or other scripts. Next, we have our interpolator, which we can use to control the positions of the entities in our scene. This is mostly used for projectiles that move from point A to point B. The implementation involves two points, or transforms, and the linear interpolation function, more commonly known as the lerp function. You have a variable t that influences the chosen position between two points, with t equals 0 being at point A, and t equals 1 being at point B. You can even opt to handle under or overshoots of our interpolator, with t less than 0 being behind point A, and t greater than 1 being beyond point B. Again, this variable t can then be controlled through your animation players, timelines, sequencers, and other scripts. Fun fact, I use a more complicated interpolator as seen in my avatar water whip involving veziers and splines. This was built with help from Freya Homer's videos on those very topics. I'll be linking those videos in the description if you want to check them out. The rotator, as you might have guessed, allows you to rotate things constantly. Input your rotation speed and then keep adding that to your object in your game's loop. Pretty straightforward. This is our last script for the video. If you want to control when to play VFX manually at runtime, then you can wait for a specific input and then call your VFX's play function. That's it for today. I hope this helped you out one way or another. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to leave them below. This whole video isn't to say that my setup is the best. This is only meant to be a loose guide for what you can do for your own VFX scene. Take what resonates with you and feel free to disagree or question points that you don't find as convincing. I'll be putting this Godot project up on my Patreon as a free download, so if you want to check it out, the link will be in the description below. Thank you to all my lovely patrons for the support, and to you for watching this video. Take care, and I hope you have a great one.